means it's time for Talk of the Bay right here on K-Squid, KSQD, Santa Cruz, your community radio station for the Monterey Bay area. I'm your Thursday evening host, Rachel Ann Goodman. It's my pleasure to be here behind the microphone and welcome the two candidates that are running for the same seat, the 28th Assembly District. Now, because of redistricting, it now includes different communities than it used to when I worked for Bill Monning and when Mark Stone was the representative. And um, maybe Gail Pellerin can start us off by simply describing who's in and who isn't isn't in, um, because maybe voters aren't even sure. Yeah. No, well, because of the redistricting we did, the district now includes Morgan Hill, and it goes up the Almanin Valley to uh, Cambrian Park, Los Gatos, Montesorino, Willow Glen, over the summit into San Lorenzo Valley, Scotts Valley, north to our Santa Cruz County line, then down to the harbor. And then it uh, uh, pops around and goes, takes a little bit of Coralitos, goes through the forest of Nicey Marks and hooks back up to Morgan Hill. And am I right in thinking that the university kind of got cut or in half? Or is the it? University's in. It's in. Okay, yes, great. Yeah. Great yeah. to know. All right. Yeah. So that if you're a voter, now you know where you stand. Um, not everyone has voted. The voting is coming up very soon, next Tuesday. Um, but not everyone has made up their mind. So this is a great opportunity for listeners to hear from these two candidates. And again, if you have a question, we welcome them via text at 831-900-5773. So I've been starting off all of these debates with just a simple question of why do you want this position <laughs> like you would in a job description, right? <laughs> um, but what do you bring to the table is also the question. So I'll start with Gail and go to Liz, and then we'll we'll be ping-ponging back and forth. Sure. So, um, well, it actually started when uh, working with local women's groups where we realized that we had never elected a woman from Santa Cruz County to an office higher than countywide, which is something I held as county clerk. So we worked on, uh, figured out that Mark Stone was due to term out in 2024. So let's identify a woman who would step up and do and run for that office. And in the course of trying to recruit somebody, it kept coming back to how about you? And so I thought, well, how about me? And for me, it's full circle. I have 35 years of public service at the state and local level. Actually got my start working in the state assembly. So I um, could lead on day one. And Um, The issues I'm concerned about are certainly our democracy, women's rights, um, and LGBTQ rights, and mental health has been something profoundly impacting my family that I feel like we're in a crisis with mental health, housing, um, climate change, education, public safety. There's so many issues out there, but um, the ones that really are driving me right now are certainly the mental health, housing, and our climate protections and education. And just to clarify, you are running as a Democrat. I'm running as a Democrat, yes. Okay. And Liz, how about you? Well, thank you for having me. And the good news is there will be a woman in this seat, (laughs) which is great news. Uh, And I fell into uh, politics organically. It all started with potholes on my street. Uh, I lobbied the city with my neighbors, and then I was appointed to the newly created Better Streets Commission, which we then created a program to improve all of our streets throughout the city. And then while on that commission, I saw needs at the city level. I ran for and was elected to council. And while on council and dealing with our housing elements and uh, Sacramento housing mandates, I realized that we needed to send some common sense, pragmatic problem solvers to Sacramento to really, who really understood what cities were going through and how difficult it was to do this. Um, I also, you know, prior to politics, I've raised three children. I have two grandchildren. I've been a room mom, a den mom, team mom, kind of done it all. I worked in advertising and I'm running because we have an imbalance in Sacramento. We have a legislature, a supermajority, and when we have that, we have we, we lack robust and healthy debate with our policies, and we're seeing the results of that now. We have policies that are driven by ideology and not by socioeconomic reality, and we need to have some sort of balance to bring those two things together. And you're running as a Republican. Yes, I am. That shouldn't be assumed because we have um, a t- top two Uh, election system now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to clarify that. Um, What would you say distinguishes you from most from your opponent? Well, I have governance experience. So I've, I, I've sit on city council and I have had to take public input and make difficult land use decisions for the betterment of our city. And I have a fiduciary duty to 
put my personal opinions aside and listen to the public and represent my residents and my constituents and, and make those decisions based on what's best for the community. I don't think you said before um, the name of the town you are. Monte Serena. Okay. I was reading just now that the average home price is $3.6 million. It's expensive. It's a tiny little town, but we do have our issues. And the most predominant one, of course, is the housing issue. And so we are working on our house. We just submitted our housing element to uh, HCD. And uh, we are uh, generating a lot of accessory dwelling units, which are all low income. And uh, we anticipate being able to house teachers and caregivers and families in need. So I didn't really hear a big difference. You said, I have elected office, um, right? You have governance experience. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you think that Gail doesn't have that? She does. She has administrative experience and executive experience, and that's great. But I also bring so much, so much, I'm not a career politician. I'm not a career public servant. And we have... Like I said, we've had, we have serious issues in our state. So not only a housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis. Our schools have fallen to 44th in the nation. We're 47th in the nation in terms of taxpayer return on investment. We have the officially the worst business climate in the country. And we've had one party rule for a long time. So we cannot continue in this fashion and continue to spend money and, and expect different results unless we're asking for change. And so I think it's really important that we break that supermajority so that we can have that healthy debate so that we can have change we need different perspective because the best policies are fashioned from engaging all perspectives because problems are multifaceted and we need to look at them from all angles and when you have only one point of view it's very difficult to address everything else well we'll we'll keep um talking about the differences because i think that's helpful for for voters to understand what mm-hmm. what people really mean when they say those things you know we're talking people who run for office, and, and I know it's easy to get into generalities, but we will get to specifics so that we can drill down a little. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to give Gail a chance to respond. So I would say the biggest difference is that I have 35 years of public service at the state and local level, and I have experience, real experience, working in Sacramento, moving legislation, working on the budget, working with constituent services. And in my role as county clerk, I was elected to that four times. And I did work collaboratively with all the different political parties, with different groups and organizations to make sure that we made uh, remove barriers to voting and that we made sure that government was accessible to people. I was very creative and putting together a Passport Saturday program or a Watsonville Clerk Service Day or our vote mobile where we were able to drive around the county and deliver voting to where people are. So making sure that government's accessible is something that I've done throughout my career. Okay, so we, we're we kind of getting more into specifics here. What policies do you think you differ the most on when it comes to, say, education? And we'll start with Gail and go to Liz. Mm-hmm. Well, I am endorsed by um, California Teachers Association, as well as other education groups and teacher organizations. And Um, I am a huge supporter of public education and making sure that no child is left behind and that we are constantly working to improve our educational system. Uh, We have the Proposition 98, which is guaranteed funding for education. And that to me is the floor, not the ceiling. And in this last budget cycle, we are investing a huge amount in education as we need to and as we should, where our per pupil spending is now going to be in the top 10 in the nation. And we have a lot of work to do, especially after the last two and a half years where kids have really been impacted by the pandemic and being isolated and having remote learning. So, you know, the test scores are coming out and they're... um, they're concerning and we need to make sure that we're providing robust learning environments for for, um, our students and making sure that our teachers have good paying jobs and good salaries and and having uh, working on housing so the teachers who are working in our community can live in our community so they're not stressed out doing long commutes. When you said I I don't think any child should be left behind I suddenly thought you're you're not endorsing no child left behind no 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 those words <laughs> sorry i know <laughs> in my ears no 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 of course no. no child should be left behind yeah. but it reminds me of the the yeah. super high stakes testing environment we yeah. endured for so long and and now aren't doing quite as much and right right so i was curious yeah um liz last time you were here um well you weren't here but you were on mm-hmm. the phone talking to our listeners we had an interesting conversation about education and where mm-hmm. you think we ought to go and I, I thought one of the things you said was that you support school vouchers um, 
Can you tell me more about that? Sure. Yeah, no, I absolutely support school choice. What happened with um, with the pandemic is it, is it certainly exposed the failures of our, of our schools. And in fact, our public schools nationwide have been failing our children for quite some time. Uh, so school choice comes in different varieties, right? It comes as, in terms of vouchers or educational savings accounts. These are your tax dollars that are going to be spent on your child's education. And in California, we spend more than half of our budget on education, yet we're not asking for any accountability or any change. And this upcoming uh, year, we're going to be spending something like $22,000 per student, which is equivalent to a private school tuition. So, um, you know, we cannot continue to throw money at something and expect change without asking for that change. So school, school choice is a very important piece. That is something that we can do now uh, because our schools are 44th in the nation. We have the lowest literacy rate in the nation at 23% of our children 15 and, and older cannot read. Um, according to the DOJ, uh, 70% of inmates cannot read beyond the fourth grade level. So we are failing our kids. There's a direct correlation between delinquency and the inability to read. So we need to change. The one thing that we can do now is legislate for school choice. And what that will do, and I know there's a lot of, a lot of people out there, especially the union doesn't like this, but it will force meaningful public school reform because we are using the same model that we that began after the industrial revolution it's a factory model and it doesn't work for our kids our kids are not pieces you know not chattel running through a through a factory we need to bring our educational system up to 21st century to a 21st century model so that every child is educated because every child is smart every child learns differently whether it's tactilely audially visually uh we need to make sure that every child um is successful within the school day and so what does that program look like it's what's what we have now isn't working so that needs to change i do believe in in public school system we just need to make it a lot better and i think charter schools are another great way to go so charter schools are one thing but school vouchers are another where you mm-hmm. would take your money out of the school system i don't n- can you explain to me how that would improve learning if we defunded public schools are you thinking it's, of a free market model where they get punished if they're not graduating enough kids or what are you No, what, I think it would force it would force competition. It would force the public school system to improve. You know, we do have uh, poorly performing districts and we have very w- highly performing districts. There's an inequity there, right? So the way it's set up is that the very children that need our help the most are the ones the marginalized children are the one the ones that are really falling through the cracks. We need to be able to provide parents that opportunity to take their tax dollars. If their public school is not working for their child, then they have that opportunity to take those tax dollars and apply it to a school or a learning situation that works best for their child. Like I said, every child is different, and there's nothing harder than being a parent knowing that your child is struggling in the school that they're in and that you, that you don't have a choice, you don't have an opportunity to put them someplace else where they will thrive and flourish. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our children are thriving and flourish where they are, and so they graduate with the self-esteem to be responsible, respectful adults. Would you like um, to respond to that, Gail Pellerin? So I do not support school vouchers. I believe the money needs to stay into public education. And I do believe there's a lot of choice in our educational system right now. We have magnet schools. We have charter schools. We have special education. And we need to make sure that education is equitable for everyone. And our most vulnerable students do have uh, a path for a, a really robust, great education. And uh, we need to provide the support to our teachers, the support and the resources so they can do the good work that they need to be doing in the classroom. So I do want to see more state leadership on this. Um, I've been reading a lot about literacy rates, and that is a problem. And there's different models of teaching literacy. So I'd like to look a little bit more at that as far as the structured literacy training, really focusing on phonics versus more behavioral um, literacy training. So I think we can provide the right tools for teachers and the right resources for them so they can do the important work that they're doing. But again, we need to make sure that they can afford to live in the communities where they're working so they're not doing these hour commutes back and forth. And um You know, and just having a lot more of our community involvement as well and supporting our school systems. I agree. If I'm if I may, I agree with Gail. Our teachers are underpaid. It's it's amazing how much we are spending and they remain underpaid. And I think it's really important that people know that the teachers union is against um, pay for performance. And I think we need to initiate pay for performance measures just like we do in the private sector so that our teachers are constantly striving to be the best that they can be. And I think we also need to revise our tenure system because here in California, teachers are tenured after two years. 
and it's permanent. What we should do is go back to the five-year model and make sure, and that's not even, and, and that may be permanent, but it's subject to review. We should have performance reviews every year just so that our teachers are also striving to be the, the best that they can be and that our children are getting the best instruction they can get. So um, putting in the free market system into a public system um, is always put forward as a solution, but um, we have so many social problems that are thrown onto s- public schools. I wonder how treating it as a business, you know, like any other business, really works because it isn't, um, it's a public good that we decide everyone has to have. Mm-hmm. Um, so how does that work if you treat it, you know, that, that teachers have to act like entrepreneurs <laughs> and uh, compete for dollars when um, they're underpaid, as you both agree. So I'll, this is the last question about this specific issue I'll, I'll ask because we have so many more to get to. But I am curious, you know, Liz, how how does that work um, if you are asking people to compete for these vouchers? Um, what happens to the kids who can't go anywhere because private schools usually cost more than whatever voucher would pay for. Well, there's more than uh, there's more than private schools. There's parochial schools. There's also learning pods and uh, online schooling. I, I I was mentioning to Gail that my my grandson is is in he's seven. He's in second grade and he's uh, in he's being homeschooled with an online program and it works really really well for him. Uh, what's work what what's happening right now? What's going on right now isn't working. So we cannot continue in this same fashion. We have to try something different. And I think the free market model can work. And I think we do have to be able to provide for those students who, who rely on schools for meals and things like that. And that could be part of the solution. We can absolutely wrap those services. Other schools provide food and food as well, you know, meals, and especially even for, for weekends and things like that. So I think it's really important that what's working right now, it, it's not working. We, we have to change it. And we, it's, otherwise, it's the definition of insanity. And our children deserve a lot better. Um, and we are talking right now about parochial schools. You, um, do you support giving money from taxpayer dollars to religious organizations that are running parochial religious schools? Yeah. No, I do not. And uh, I think that the money needs to stay in our public schools. And like I said, with this this recent budget, we are investing a huge amount in our schools, as we should have been doing all along. And the lack of that funding did mean that we fell to the bottom third in our per pupil spending. So now that we're up in the top 10 again, I believe that providing those teachers with those essential resources, the schools with the resources that they need to have great learning environments for our kids and meeting all the various diverse needs of our our students as well, and including mental health. I mean, right now, we are in a mental health crisis, and we need to have mental health counselors on, on school campuses. We need to have wellness centers. We really need to be focusing on those students and providing that individualized learning um, you know, curriculum so we can bring the students ahead and get them ready for success in their future. So I want to shift over. You mentioned mental health. Um, can, I'm I, curious. can I just follow up on that? Uh, yeah, briefly, and then I want okay, to shift really over quickly. to a new topic. Sure. Well, well, with parochial schools, what's great about them, first of all, it's your tax dollars, right? So your tax dollars are just being directed to a different place. Parochial schools provide a very family-friendly environment, and um, fa- the faith-based community, whether you know, whatever it is, um, y- y- you learn character and moral values, and I think those are things that we're, we're, we're lacking in our society right now. Thank you. Okay, so back to the mental health issue. Um, what do you think is the top priority for the state legislature in California to do to help people? Um, from a local perspective, I can tell you that Santa Cruz County is sending people out of the county right. to hospitals because right. there's not enough beds. Right. So um, that's one thing, but that that's only the tip of the iceberg. So yeah. more funding, more facilities. What do you think the answer is? I mean, we go back to Ronald Reagan and I know he was part of your party, and a lot of people revere him, but he did just completely eliminate all the state hospitals and didn't really have a plan B, and we're still seeing the sad after effects of that, I think. Yeah. Um, so what's the solution? We don't necessarily want to go back there, but there there was no plan B. So what right. is plan B now? Well, well, I think when the state hospitals closed, the plan was to have uh, community mental health clinics. And that just didn't happen at the rate that we needed them to happen. So we're in a crisis. We are in a public health crisis when it comes to mental health. And we need to have all hands on deck. Uh, We did 
enact the 988 emergency mental health hotline. So that's a federal number where you can call or text for mental health when you're in a crisis. And uh, the state did pass AB 988, which is going to provide a funding mechanism for mental health programs in California. And they're putting together an advisory committee to put together a five-year plan. You know, but this has got to happen quickly. We got to start moving very quickly on this. And um, and mobile mental health care is one big piece of that. Twenty four seven, three sixty five, mobile mental health care. So if I'm sitting here right now and I have a heart attack, you call nine one one, an ambulance comes to take care of me. If I have a mental health crisis and I'm you know needing help, there's no one. There's a nine eight eight number to call to get assistance over the line, but nobody to come to assist. So. We need to have that kind of service available. And then exactly what you said, a place to go to get care. So we need to have the beds. We need to have the facilities. We need to have the trained mental health workers. And there's such a workforce shortage right now on mental health workers as well. So we need to make sure that we're um, providing avenues for people to get into those careers and then the funding necessary to provide for the, the beds that we need and the programs we need to meet the needs of our community. And this goes back to private versus public, Mm because we have a private um, mental health hospital here run by a private company, Mm for-profit company. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as odd that we have for-profit health care at all, but mental health in particular is the most vulnerable part of the population. So, Liz, do you um, think that that's working? (laughs) doesn't seem to be to me. Okay, so just to go back a minute, um, it was the ACLU in the 60s that led efforts to defund um the site to defund psychiatric hospitals and uh and and um compelled care ronald reagan was governor at the time it was a national movement yes he did close them down was that a mistake i believe that was a mistake ronald reagan also legalized abortion in the state of california so it's not a party thing it was what was going on at the time um I, you know, those folks wound up, you know, uh, they wound up either homeless or incarcerated. So that was a travesty. And what's great about Care Corps and what Newsom has recognized is the need for compelled care to be part of the solution. Um, I do believe that we can use existing facilities and, and repurpose them. We need more psychiatric beds, not only for adults, but for our adolescents. Our adolescents are, are woefully underserved. There's only one adolescent psych ward in Northern California. It's in Fremont. So if we really want to focus on, on pre- preventative care, we really need to help our adolescents and our parents and families with children suffering. Give them the tools and the and the education they need to help their their children when they come home from these hospitals. Uh, I do believe uh, we need to, rather than maybe spending millions of dollars moving unhoused folks from one place to the next, we can use that money to uh, pay for and uh, invest in mental health care professional development. And we need more people on the ground. And I think those community centers would be great. We do need to have facilities for people to go to who cannot care for themselves because it should, they should not be incarcerated. They need to be in care. That's where we need to go with this. Okay, we're going to take a teeny tiny break and give you a chance to text us your questions. I have a couple um, that are lined up here and some of which we have not addressed yet. If you want to get in on the conversation, text us at 831-900-5773. You're listening to K-Squid, and we're talking with Liz Lawler and Gail Pellerin, two candidates vying for the same position to be the next representative of the 28th Assembly District. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. Stay tuned. KSQD is holding a silent auction on November 19th in Carmel Valley to support our signal expansion campaign. Do you have an Airbnb or another item of value you'd like to donate? Please contact us to discuss your donation. Email info at ksqd.org or call 831-900-5773 and leave a voicemail. Thank you. And we're at KSQD Santa Cruz, your community radio station. And coming up at 6 o'clock, it's Amy Chen Mills with part two of Talk of the Bay. So stay tuned. She'll have more guests with more conversation. And I will add that we will be here election eve. We've been doing a series of debates uh, with various candidates for state and local office. And we will be taking a look at the midterms as they unfold from the East Coast to the West we probably won't have a lot of results during the evening, as we, as Gail Pellerin <laughs> well knows. It seems to have gotten slower, and um, we could talk about why in another interview. But this is true. We won't have a lot of local results, but we will be calling candidates from out in the field to see, 
you know, what their take is on the whole unfolding evening. We mm-hmm. don't really know what's going to happen. There's a lot of really tight races around the country. And a lot of people are saying that, you know, what's really consequential about the midterms right now is that um, some of the people running for office are denying that the election uh, went to Joe Biden, which is very concerning. And some of them are mm-hmm. looking for the position you hold in a lot mm-hmm. of these um, county election clerks. Um, do either of you believe that the election was stolen? Liz, your party, a lot of people in your party seem to believe that. I, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, I think there's just a, there's the few noisy people, but no, of course not. I believe in the integrity of our election system, and I believe Joe Biden's our duly elected president. And as a Republican, regardless of who I vote for, and I vote, I don't vote party line. I vote for who I think is best, and I always support who's elected president because we have a vested interest in his or her success. So you just said that it's only a few loud people, but a lot of very reputable surveys from all sides of the aisle say a pretty large proportion of Republican Party members do believe that. Well, that's unfortunate. No, I believe in the integrity of our election system. I dedicated my career to it, 27 and a half years here in Santa Cruz County, making sure that the vote was accessible and accurate and trans, um, transparent and secure. And, um, yeah, it's, it's horrible what's happening right now in our country where people are election deniers or running for these key positions. We actually had in, Santa, in um, California, there were, I think, three or four county clerks that had opposition in the primary of people who were election deniers. And, and fortunately, they lost that election. So, um, so we're good in California. It almost seems like uh, the democracy is what's on the ballot. Yeah, I say that often. I believe that democracy is on the ballot. And I've been a fighter for voting rights, for reproductive rights, for LGBTQ plus I, uh, rights as well, and um, and the rights to live in safe and affordable communities. So, Well, well somebody had a question, actually, for you. Um, actually, this is for Liz. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to start reading some of these um, because they're coming in, and I want to make sure we get to them. Um, Liz has said, I think they're referring to maybe a previous interview Mm-hmm. or a forum. I don't know. I wasn't there. Liz has said that transgender children should be able, should not be able to access gender affirming care until they're 18. Please explain why. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I do believe democracy is on the ballot because we do have one party rule in our state. So democracy requires at least two parties to function. But going forward to LGBTQ rights, I, you know, I, I am concerned because I hear, you know, it, it, children, you're 18, but we consider people to be adults at the age of 18. So medical decisions prior to that are really under the purview of parents. Now, I understand the need, you know, so I am open-minded, but I am concerned about children making decisions, medical decisions for themselves that are irreparable and, and create permanent damage. And I think that's where we have to be really concerned. Listen, I am for, you know, I have, my oldest son is gay. My youngest son has his best friend is transgender. I believe we all should be able to be who we are and feel comfortable in our own skin and live our truth. I am concerned, though, when we get into a situation where children are making decisions that they're not really fully developed to make and then live with the consequences of that. So is what you're saying that the parents are also not able to make those decisions with their child, together with their children, that you want the state involved in their medical decisions? I'm a little unclear. No, I don't want the state involved in their medical decisions. So we ought to be concerned about what policy are you referring to, if any? I it was brought up at the Almaden uh, forum that there was uh, gender affirming care happening at UCSF, and if it were to be mandated by the government, what would we do to legislate about it, and what kind of protections would we put in place? And that was the question. And the question really would be making sure that parents were completely involved from step one all the way through, and that they were not precluded or excluded from any decision making. Do you have any response? You want to chime in on any of this? Again, I think this is a private issue that a person has with their doctor. And as a young person, you know, um, definitely involving the parents, but ultimately, it's that individual's decision with their doctor. And let's move to the uh, Proposition 1 on the ballot, the state ballot. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it's a citizen proposition. Um, It would ensconce um, the right to an abortion in our Constitution. Mm -hmm. How do each of you stand on that issue? 
I support Proposition 1. I've been endorsed by Planned Parenthood and Emily's List and um, NARAL and other women's organizations that support reproductive freedom. And I've been a fighter for reproductive rights all my life. I cannot believe we are still fighting this today in 2022. And as a mother of a daughter who's 24 and a son who's 27, it limits their choices on where they get to live in this nation because they will not be living in states that do not allow for Uh, equal rights of everybody there. And this is a private decision a person makes with their doctor, period. Liz? Well, I believe in a women's right to choose. And I wish Roe had not been overturned because it created a lot of anxiety for women throughout the country. Um, Proposition one, I would I would support if there were language specifically uh, referencing Roe in terms of viability. It doesn't do that. And so there was a Berkeley study that uh, admitted that it could pre- create legal problems in the future uh, and potentially impact a women's right to choose in California. So I, I would support it if it had that language in it. Okay, um, let me see what other questions we have coming in. Um, this next one. At the Lookout Forum, both candidates said they thought everyone should be able to access birth control without parental consent. Liz Lawler said has said that trans kids shouldn't be able... Oh, sorry, that was the same question. (laughs) Sorry, okay. Um, We'll just wait. we clarified that. Yeah, we did. Um, Let's move on to housing and homelessness, a Mm -hmm. huge issue Mm -hmm. for our region um, with the disparity of income gap Mm -hmm. becoming more great every day. Um, They just cleared a homeless camp in Santa Cruz. Uh, Let's talk about homelessness first and then the related issues. So, um, Gail, what do you think are the top priorities if you were elected, that you'd like to tackle concerning homelessness? Yeah. Well, the answer to homelessness is housing and also to keep those who are at risk of becoming homeless in the places where they're currently living. So uh, rental subsidies and, and rent help is very important to keep people in their homes. And those who are, uh, who are unsheltered, you know, we need to find a place for them to be. And we need to build more permanent supportive housing. Once we get them into housing, we need to provide the services they need, whether it be mental health, addiction, trauma care, workforce development, and to be able to get them to the point where they can live a healthy, thriving life. So, um, and we have good models for this. Uh, Homeless Garden Project here in Santa Cruz County has done amazing work to Uh, bring our homeless community into uh, a place where they get um, to work together and they get to build relationships and they get to learn skills and they work with them on finding housing and jobs and they have a excellent success rate. I think 80% of their people graduate from the program within three months. So it's a great model that I think could be replicated elsewhere. But that's an NGO, right? It's not a state program. Right. No, no, no. Definitely that. Yeah, yeah. But it could use state support. So I think at the state level, yes, you know, I'm, uh, I'd be interested in doing a housing bond to make sure that we can provide housing to um, – we've got a lot to build. We have a lot of housing to build, and we need to do it affordably. We need to do it uh, that makes sense. Uh, having modular housing would work. The tiny homes are one example. Housing Matters over here at, um, on River Street, they are doing a great job as well. And we're, we are housing more people. We are housing, getting people off the street. But as that population grows, we're also getting more people who are losing their housing. And that's primarily due to the pandemic and just the economy, which is in dire straits right now. And like I said, I think one other piece of that is to help people stay in the homes that they have so they don't become house, uh, homeless. So you're thinking maybe rental vouchers like that were done during uh, yeah, COVID? Yeah, I think we need to continue with some rental assistance. Absolutely. Yeah. Liz, what, what would your top priority be uh, to deal with homelessness? Well, I mean, there's so many, so many different reasons why somebody may become homeless, right? But the primary drivers are mental illness and addiction. So like I mentioned before with mental illness, is providing that space and those bed space and get people the care that they need, uh, providing families with temporary conservatorships to help their loved ones experiencing homelessness or addiction, providing them that the ability to get them the care that they need. Uh, and then ov- obviously we need to continue and, and increase support on with uh, of 
entities on the ground that are helping our homeless every single day with clothing and showers and things like that because they are the people who really truly know what's going on and streamlining uh, the co- communications between agencies so that when someone's experiencing homelessness they can go to they can go get help and, get, and seek it and get it in real time versus being shuttled from one place to the next and then of, of course as as Gail had mentioned there are successful models and there's another one called beyond homeless uh, which is another NGO um, that uh, what's the think tank they have a model that is creates a campus where you get 360 degree services so kind of like a college campus where someone experiencing homelessness can go get housing security food security and right there on that campus they can get skills training mental health care all of the services are there so they're not having to be shuffled from one court or one place to the next and and there's a perfect example this uh, in San Antonio of this model. It's called Haven Haven for Hope, and it has an 80% success rate of getting people back onto their feet and back into the working world. So, again, partnerships. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. it cannot be a government solution because it's just too broad. It's too difficult. We need to engage and support the private sector and work with them, um, and pl- entities like the Salvation Army, too, and just provide that support because it's, it, it's going to need a lot of us to, working together to help. I think, yeah, collaboration is going to be key. You know, with the federal government, the state government, county, city, local organizations, we all need to work together. And this is another one of those crises that we need to address. It is a public health crisis. If you looked at um, the people who were, you know, housed and then who weren't in the recent clearing Mm -hmm. of the homeless camp, there were some people in wheelchairs that just got stuck up on the levee by themselves with no, they didn't want to go to the shelter for whatever reason. So there they were, you know, what and were they going to do? And if we truly are the fifth and maybe the fourth largest economy in the world, we should be able to address this problem. We should be able to meet the needs of our people and make sure they're housed and have basic needs met. And that right. takes us to housing. <laughs> yeah, goes back to housing, <laughs> which we'll talk about next. Um, there is a listener who wrote in a skeptical question for Liz, or maybe it was a statement. Um, how could serving in Monte Sereno, population less than 3,500 people, Average home price three point five million make Liz qualified for this district, so they want you to make your case, I guess. <laughs> well, no, that's a that's a great question. It's a completely valid question. But I am the kind of person that I am dedicated to serving you, our residents. I will listen to you. I am not beholden to special interests. I, if you look at who's back of me, it's 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 people in my community. I really care about what matters and what matters to you matters to me. And I have done a lot of work over the years, whether it's volunteering in our community. These are things that that are important. And I want to return the voice of the voter to Sacramento. I want to go back to abortion because there was something you said in our interview I wanted to ask you about. It's been a while, but I read I listened back through it. And I think you said, but you could correct me because it was a while ago that You didn't support women from other states coming to California, like states like Texas, to get abortions. Is that what you meant? No, that's not what I said. What I said was we would be using tax dollars to pay for the travel, and it's up to the voters to decide whether or not that's what they want. Okay. So if the voters passed a resolution, you'd be in support of it. It's just some concept. Yeah, if the voters decide that's what they want to do with their tax dollars, but that's that's our tax dollars that's supposed to go towards California infrastructure and services being delivered to us as Californians. So it creates a question, and you have to really challenge that. Like, is that what it's best for? But if that's what the voters want? But I don't think that's what's happening. I I think it's... Planned Parenthood that's putting out these mobile units well, and, that's, and that's where it should be. Yeah, it and shouldn't building, be tax dollars. Building so we, new clinics right near the right airport. Near the airports, right. yeah. No, that yeah. was yeah. Then that was a reference to a, a bill that was that would have spent tax dollars. Okay. Um, someone wanted us to dis- you to discuss mm-hmm. uh, contraceptive rights uh, for both of you. I, I have a hard time believing that contraceptive rights are actually on the yeah. table yeah. here. Right. It, only because one of the <laughs> Supreme Court justices said. That could be next. Right, right. Wow. After right. Roe v. Wade. And what were they talking about? I mean, about? yeah, we need to make contraception more accessible, affordable, easy to get for people because, um, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and lowering the cost for sure we need to do it. I, I think it should be over the counter. And, um, you know, and then as far as abortion services, you know, they're, they're safe. They're legal. We need to make sure they're affordable. We need to remove the stigma. And we do have medical abortion services as well. And I think that might be helpful in some of these states where women don't have access to surgical. 
Well, I, I believe that, yeah, we should have absolutely access to to uh, contraceptives, and it should be free, frankly. And if everyone had access to contraceptives and practice safe sex, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have an abortion problem. It's the best anti-abortion That's, stance in go. the world, but I don't well, understand why some people want to limit that at the same time yeah. they want to limit abortion. It doesn't well, make that doesn't, logical. No, that doesn't make sense. And abortion it's, is health care. Yeah. It's health care. It is. Um, moving on to housing, um, which is the closely related topic to homelessness. Um, I heard one time in L.A. alone they needed to build 500,000 affordable units just to stay up with a demand. Mm-hmm. That's not happening. It's not happening here. So what's the solution? We are definitely behind in the number of houses for people. Mm-hmm. What do we do yeah. as a state? Well, I heard 2.5 million is the number in the state that need to be built. And it's a variety of housing from very, very low income to market rate housing, depending on the area. And um, every jurisdiction has their RENA goals, the the eight-year plan on goals on meeting the housing needs. And I know when those came out recently, it was pretty shocking because it was a lot higher number than any jurisdiction anticipated. So, um, so yeah, we need to make sure that we are working toward those goals. We need to be doing um, um, development, infill development, downtown, near transit hubs, making sure they're electrified, they're, they're good environmental buildings, and, um, and have a, a variety of different levels of, of, for income. So it has to be done, you know, whether it, and we need to provide the funding mechanism to do that, whether it be a housing bond or, or, or something along those lines or a state subsidy to get that housing built. But and we got to do it again quickly. You know, there's <laughs> a lot we need to do. So we might have we have to work on streamlining the processes so these these places can be built. Liz? Well, I don't think we should be uh, issuing bonds and, and taxing uh, residents more because we're already heavily taxed. But two things that we can do at the state level is stop subsidizing market rate housing and start subsidizing low income housing, number one. Number two, give tax credits to cities, not keep them in the back room in Sacramento to be granted to whatever developer decides to do the project. So if you give cities the tax credits, then you give them the wherewithal and the flexibility to actually build low income housing and work with local developers to create smaller, successful, small infill projects that actually work for the community. So that's how we can spur that because that's free market. You don't need to subsidize market rate housing. That That's handled yeah. by the free market. So those are a couple of things that we can do right off the bat that would, would make change. Um, so there's this fund that people can pay into for affordable housing where they don't have to build those units. They can just throw it into the fund, but the fund doesn't get spent on it. So is there any reforms we could do about that? I've heard that you know, if you're a developer, you're building a big mm-hmm. apartment complex, instead of building those affordable units, you can just pay some money into a fund. Right. Um, but it, that fund it doesn't, doesn't seem logical. It doesn't come back <laughs> to the yeah. community to get used as affordable housing money. So right. Right. besides bonds, other ideas for how to spur developers to want to do that, incentivize them, whatever, to build low income housing or affordable, or whatever you want to call it, workforce housing. Yeah, we make it a mandate, you know, that there's got to be a certain percentage of uh, low income housing for communities. You can't just yeah. buy your way out of yeah. it, in other words. Okay, those are all reasonable approaches. Can, so, I, can tech, I add yeah. to that? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we are becoming a state of mandates, um, but I think, you know, a, a lot of the legislation that we've passed recently really favors developers, and we need to stop doing that. We need to uh, obviously. We need to make it illegal for foreign entities to purchase homes that are taking houses off of the market for otherwise middle-income families. So there's a lot of other things that we can do to incentivize uh, housing production without favoring the developers necessarily. Okay, I want to mention again that if you have a question, this would be the time to do it before we run out of time. And the number to text is H31-900-5773. You're listening to Community Radio K-Squid. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman, and I'm here in the studio with Republican Liz Lawler and Democrat Gail Pellerin. They are both running for the 28th Assembly District, the seat formerly held or still held Mm -hmm. (laughs) until election and and inauguration day by Mark Stone. And now it's a different shaped district that includes Morgan Hill and many other communities uh, over the hill in in addition to Santa Cruz. Um, Where to go next? There's so many things. Taxation. So we talked about bonds for housing Mm -hmm. in general. Um, what do you favor as a way to pay for programs that are needed, like mental health and housing? What's the structure? Mm-hmm. And, and do we have the right mix right now, or would you favor right. changing that 
Gail. Well, and we had this great budget surplus this year, over I think a hundred billion dollars, and um, and a lot of that went into infrastructure. A lot of it went into um, um, mental health care. It went into education. Checks for the gas pump. Checks, yeah. It? Checks. Uh, yeah. Some that money's seemed ridiculously coming. wasteful and political yeah. to me. Some Sorry, money's coming back. To, yeah. 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 Four hundred dollars. So, what a. You know. Right. Right. So you know. Probably not the best uh, use of it. But anyway, the money has been spent. And uh, it also went into a rainy day fund and a reserve fund, which is super important to keep our stability in future years because we're going to be getting into some very difficult budget years. And um, and so I think we need to look at how money is currently being spent. The money we have, how are we spending it? And is are those funds getting into the hands of the people doing the good work to resolve the issues in their communities? Uh, I was talking to a housing group over in Santa Clara County that said that they were getting money for Project Home Key, but they really needed it for another purpose. So I'd like the state to be looking a little bit more on um, flexibility and with accountability. So not just handing out money, but making sure that people are held accountable. And, um, you know, just back to the homeless situation, too, that there are nine state departments that administer 41 different homeless programs. That, to me, says inefficiency as well. So understanding what everybody's doing, understanding what money we have, and then getting into the hands of the people that are doing the good work. Liz? Well, your, you know, the spend money to send money example you just gave with the uh, gas cards is a perfect example of wasteful spending, right? I mean, that was $9 billion, which could have been applied to something, you know, far more important. Um, and we could have just given everyone a tax break at the pump. And we, apparently we are now the worst state in the country in terms of our road infrastructure. So where where is that going? So to Gail's point, you know, we do need to streamline. We need to audit everything. We need to streamline everything. We have far too much bureaucracy. We have far too many hands you know, in the pot, too, too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, when my dad was commissioner of corporations, he slashed that department by by two thirds to create efficiencies so that they could better root out fraud. So there, we have far too much government bloat, and we need to audit everything and reduce wasteful spending, and make sure that our dollars is being spent wisely, as well as, you know. Yes, we had the surplus, but it's going to be grim for the next few years. We, you know, we, we really are going to enter into an austerity. So it's really, really important that we do what we can to maximize every single dollar without going to the taxpayer. Well, the next question might involve taxpayers. I don't know. Um, AB 32 was designed to reduce climate change, uh, producing gases, and to make us more efficient as a state. There have been several other climate bills but um, as one of the longest coastlines <laughs> states, we have seen the impacts of climate change, and we, we have had wildfires as well. So what do you think the best use of California's money is when it comes to trying to combat climate change and meet our goal? You know, the governor said uh, no gasoline-powered cars after 30, 2037. 30, yeah. So what's going to need to happen between now and then to make this state operate well? Right now, you look on the freeways, and not even anybody carpooling, even though the gas prices are high. Yeah, we love our cars. Right. Yeah. So what's going to happen, uh, Gail and then Liz? So, yeah, I mean, we definitely need to reduce our dependency on our cars, and um, we need to do everything we can to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And that does take an investment, not only in our transportation systems, but also in our um, building housing that is environmentally safe and and efficient so we're not causing more damage to our planet um we also have a huge issue with the drought and making sure that we have enough water to meet the needs of our our state and um i'm really encouraged by projects like the soquel creek water district that's doing the gray water recycling and basically taking that water purifying it putting it back into the ground basin because that's really our best storage place for water versus reservoirs because when we have this extreme heat the reservoirs are evaporating and we also have problems with the blue green algae so i do like the concept of putting that water back into our 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 groundwater basins and um yeah with our fires you know we, we were lucky this season you know we were lucky that Things did not go that that badly. We had good weather for the most part. We didn't have weather bad weather with extreme winds, so we got through this season pretty well. But fire departments are understaffed, and um, we need to make sure they have all the resources they need to um, be the 
firefighters that we need them to be when there's an emergency. So, um, and they're also working on reducing that fuel that's currently existing on the ground. So we need to make sure that that gets taken care of as well so we don't just have that sitting there that's going to ignite another fire. So I guess my question was partly about, you know, response to extreme weather events and how we're going to be resilient as mm-hmm. a state, which is a big deal. But on the other side of it is preventing um, further, you know, right? pollution uh, of the skies with more and more carbon output and methane and other gases. Um, we are a big agriculture state. Yeah, so. Right. So what are some of the, yeah, Liz, what are some of the ways you would look at the prevention side of this? Well, you know, I think, well, first of all, California is a car culture, right? And we have to wrap our heads around that. And we do not have a viable public transportation system that people choose to take over driving a car. But, you know, hopefully we'll get there. Um, but what we can do right now is invest in nuclear power. It's clean, it's safe, it's durable. And at least our governor has recognized the need to keep Diablo Canyon open longer. Um, it really is the future, and we can eliminate it. Diablo Canyon provides 10% of our state's power. For solar to d- deliver the same amount, we would need 90,000 acres of solar panels, whereas Diablo Canyon sits on 900 acres. So it's efficient. Um, and as far as investing in other programs, you know, I think nuclear is key. We should use every tool in our toolbox. The creation of hydrogen, hydrogen is amazing. It's an interest, really, we need to focus on that as well. Um, wave technology, there's all kinds of things um, that we can do. Every type of energy that we explore has a negative impact on the environment. So we need to, if we spread it out amongst a variety of things and not sp- specifically solar or electric cars, for example, or wind, we can uh, prevent catastrophic uh, environmental damage to certain ecosystems, right? So lithium comes from the deep sea. Um, So we need to be a lot more thoughtful about that. And um, preventative, again, it's, uh, I would like to see, you know, where I think our, our, our governor likes to set big, hairy goals, which, you know, I understand that to drive the innovation, right? But at the same time, you have to have a transition plan to get there. Um, with all electric sales by 2037, okay, but that's not accessible for everyone. Whereas an intermediary step might be to, per, you know, make that all hybrid vehicles because that's more accessible to people, right? That's easier for most Californians to transition to, and they're available, and they're more affordable. So we could at least make those baby steps to get to the big goal. But that's that's what I want to see is I want to see real interme- intermediary goals that we can actually achieve and provide our municipalities and our residents the flexibility to achieve those goals. And there's certainly a lot of infrastructure that's got to be considered, too, for all electric vehicles out there. We need to have the charging stations. and, um, and There's a proposition on the ballot yeah. to do that. It yeah. would tax uh, millionaires over $4 million. Yeah a year um, to fund that. So um, how do you each stand on that? Not that you, you know, you're going to vote as one person, but you might end up being, you know, reacting to what's being done as a result of it. So how does that affect you or any of your plans if you found out that that was happening, if it passes, for example? If it passes, then it gives us more money to, to do the infrastructure development that we need. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, my understanding of Prop 30 is that it would fund subsidies to help people get into all electric vehicles. It's charging stations, as I understood it. Is it charging stations? Mm-hmm. So they've changed. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, that's up to the voters, right? Yep, but exactly. we, we do need that infrastructure. It's not there yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we are going to go to final statements in just a moment. But one person wrote in and asked me to ask you, Liz, if you're a member of Take Back Santa Cruz. Do you know of that group? I do not. Okay, then they must tell me not about be. it. Yeah, um, well, don't I don't know. I'm it. just asking on behalf of one of our listeners. So the okay. answer is no. There you go. Um, so we have about five minutes. Well, actually, we have three minutes because I have. I'm going to play a short piece here at the end of the show, and then make way for the next guest. Mm-hmm. So, um, in wrapping up, if you could encapsulate some of your vision ideas for our state from this district. You know, maybe top three priorities Mm -hmm. as you're closing and then any other things you want to say to voters about why they should vote for you. So um, let's see. We went that way. So we'll start with Liz and end with Gail. Well, um, you know, I think, you know, when I canvass all over the district, the most common theme is people want to feel safe in their communities. They want to educate their children and they want to afford their gas and groceries. So cost of living obviously is a big deal in California and it's driving 
all of the issues that we're facing, right, with with lack of affordable housing, obviously gas prices, et cetera. And that, that's really on the table right now. And with inflation, it's even worse. And with recession, it's even worse, especially for people on fixed incomes and our retirees, right? So those are the things I want to focus on is addressing those cost of living issues. I want to address public safety. As you're all aware here, uh, the graffiti problem that was cropping up all over Santa Cruz and really impacting our businesses, it's not fair that our businesses have to spend time and money cleaning that up. But what's the bigger picture is that they don't even report it anymore because it's so common. Right. And so in fact, somebody really likes you because they graffitied all over I, our county. I, I don't even name. and I don't know who it is. I, I um, would like them to stop. Um, but at the end of the day, the big it's, it's unfair because it's a quality of life thing. So we do need to hold our leaders accountable. So that's, you know, the fact that no one can no one's no one wants to report it anymore because it's so commonplace that, you know, that makes me sad. So we, we do need to have better consequences for these things that impact the quality of our businesses and the quality of life here in Santa Cruz. So de- definitely that. And of course, education. I'm passionate about education and our children are our future. And we do need to refashion how we educate our kids for the future. We need to bring it into the 21st century and how whatever that looks like, I would like to create a commission to make that happen, a commission that involves all stakeholders to make that happen, because we do we owe that to our children and to ourselves. And then, of course, the cost of living thing I already talked about. So I am available. I understand the dynamics of of this district. I know everyone's scratching their heads about Santa Cruz being in the same district as Morgan Hill. Um, I do want to encourage people, though, that I I am absolutely here and available, and I do care, and I will work really, really hard on you beha- on your behalf. Thank you. That was Liz Lawler, a pol- Republican candidate for 28th Assembly District. Liz, thank you for coming in to K-Squid. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. And Gail. Yeah. So I have a proven track record of working with all political parties and diverse groups and organizations and bringing people together. Democracy can only thrive when all people have a place at the table and a voice. And speaking of your voice, it is so important for you to get out and vote. I'm wearing my vote necklace and earrings just because I'm a huge advocate to make sure people's voices are heard. It's a great equalizer we have that everyone's vote counts the same. And um, you're, if you don't vote, then it, you're not having your voice heard. You're not being a part of our, our community. So please get out there and turn that ballot in. And as far as, you know, I've got 35 years of public service. I have um, been working hard to make sure that government is accessible to people. Um, and my family has been profoundly impacted by mental health. I see it as a public health crisis. So that's one of the top issues for me to make sure that we have affordable, accessible mental health care. Uh, housing, I think, is a huge problem. Our homeless situation, they're tied together and bringing those services to people who need them as far as mental health, addiction, uh, trauma care. And, uh, you know, none of this matters if we don't have a planet that is sustainable that we can pass on to further ge- our future generations. So as a mother, hopefully someday a grandmother, you know, I want to make sure that we have a planet that's sustainable and that's going to be a top priority for me. Gail, thank you also for coming in. Really thank appreciate you. your time. This is KSQD Santa Cruz. First Person Singular is next, followed by an extended version of Talk of the Bay. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. See you election night right here on 90.7 FM.